Tick Mitch Jezerich. Mary Wollstonecraft, one of the earliest feminist writers and philosophers of the Western world, dedicated her iconic book, A Vindication of the Rights of Woman, to the monumental French revolutionary figure Charles Maurice Talleyrand, whose 1791 report to French Assembly stated that women, women should only receive domestic education. Her dedication was an attempt to encourage Talleyrand to read it. She wrote this, quote, If women are to be excluded without having a voice from a participation of the natural rights of mankind, prove first to ward off the charge of injustice and inconsistency that they want reason, else this flaw in your new constitution will ever show that man must, in some shape, act like a tyrant. I do believe she was referring to the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen, a monumental human rights document achieved during the French Revolution, in which women would not end up receiving the same rights as men. Today, we are going to be in conversation about Mary Wollstonecraft and her book, A Vindication of the Rights of Women. My guest is Susan J. Wolfson. Susan Wolfson is a professor of English at Princeton University, and she is the author of a new book called On Mary Wollstonecraft's a vindication of the rights of woman. Susan, Susan Wolfson, it is a very good pleasure to welcome you to this program. Well, glad to be here. I'm excited to have this conversation about Mary Wollstonecraft, a very fascinating and, and complex figure. And one of the things that I've always personally gotten excited about when I studied her was was her how her actually her involvement in the French Revolution. She she she's from she's she's from England. But she would go to France for the revolution uh, just days before uh, King Louis the Sixteenth was was beheaded. Uh, weeks, yeah, weeks. But... Tell me about tell me about Mary Wollstonecraft in the French Revolution. What's important to know? Well, she was very excited, as many um, English uh, British progressives were, about the events in France. No one thought that it was possible to imagine the overthrow of a monarchy. Monarchy had been the way of Western governments uh, for millennia. Uh, so the French Revolution was a kind of an electric moment for progress. Even English conservatives um, felt that France, which had been a tyrannical monarchy, um, was now going to be more enlightened on the model, so they said, of English liberty. Progressives in England had a different story to tell. Mary Wollstonecraft's tutor in the French Revolution was a dynamic uni uh, Unitarian preacher named Richard Price. And he gave um, a sermon um, in uh, November uh, 1789, just months after the revolution, in which he said, you know, little did I hope um, that I would ever live to see thousands of people emancipated. And he used the language of emancipation. Big champion of the American Revolution as well. So two revolutions, progressives felt that a revolution in England, um, not necessarily to overthrow the monarchy, but certainly to make it more responsible um, to its wide population, um, was inevitable. Um, the French Revolution was showing the way. This was 1789. Now, Edmund Burke, uh, who is still the North Star of conservative philosophy, felt otherwise. He thought that the French Revolution was a catastrophe, that democracy could only be chaos, um, that this was the end of Western civilization as we knew it, and he had a virulent attack on Price and the principles of the French Revolution called Reflections of the Recent Revolution in France. Now, Burke was not um, an expected voice for this. He was for the abolition of slavery. He was against colonial corruption in England. He supported the principles of the American Revolution, taxation without representation. No one expected him to explode this way. Hmm. And so Wollstonecraft was beside herself with anger. She asked to review his book um, for the Analytical Review, the, the chief opposition journal of her day. And when she got started on the review of Burke, she realized that she had much more to say. Um, and so even though the reviews could be as much as 10 or 12 pages long, she had a book in her. 
So she wrote a vindication of the rights of men within weeks. I mean, it was really rapid response journalism. That comes out on the same month as Burke's Reflections. It was the first response to Burke months ahead of Tom Paine, whose rights of man then went on to international fame. It was widely admired. It went into a second edition, Wollstonecraft's pamphlet, um, by December, and her name appeared on the cover of the second edition. Not on the first. And, not on the first. The first was anonymous, and many people thought it was just one of those left-wing progressive men um, you know, who was taking on Burke. So it was a double sort of surprise. Mm. Not only was this a stunning refutation of Burke, and it's, a, it's very readable, it's short, it's sarcastic, it's funny, it's penetrating, um, but that it was a woman who had done this. And so her reputation was made um, by uh, that um, by that event. Now this was still 1790. Wollstonecraft doesn't go to France until 1792. Um, by 1792, she had tried to go during the summer with her publisher and you know a, a couple of friends. And they turned back when they heard about all the civil violence in France. The September massacres happened. Thousands of people were, were slaughtered just for suspected affiliation with the Ancien Regime monarchy um, or of not being totally on board with the French Revolution. This was the beginning of the era that was called the Terror. Um, Wollstonecraft was determined to go anyway. And by December of 1792, she said, I'm going neck or nothing. That was November, actually. She really thought she was going to live in France. She gave away her cat. She packed her bags. She went on her own, which was extraordinary for a woman to do. Her task, her assignment from her publisher, Joseph Johnson, was to be writing letters home to the English about events in France. She gets there. And the streets are filled with blood. The terror trials are going on. She's alone in a large mansion um, in Paris without a complete command of the language. She had taught herself French, but the um, new revolutionary government, among other things, renamed all the streets, all the days, all the months. Um, so she was not even sort of competent on the basic French 101 level. Um, her hostess was out of town and she was kind of managing, you know, a stranger in a strange land. The prison that held um, Louis Capet, now Citizen Capet, no longer Louis the Sixteenth, was in her area. And from the roof of her mansion, she could watch his coach go back and forth to trial. The trial began the day after Christmas in, um, in 1792. Hmm. And he was, as everyone knew, he was condemned. He was executed in January. Um, Wollstonecraft expected to find the France that had been described by its first enthusiasts. William Wordsworth said he was there in 1791. He said, bliss was it in that dawn to be alive, to be young and very heaven. Um, another friend of hers, Helen Mariah Williams, wrote ecstatic letters from France in the summer of 1790 when she attended the Fête de la Fédération, the first anniversary of the revolution. It was the Woodstock of, of the summer of 1790. Thousands of people there, peaceful demonstrations, a celebration of the new era. The king and queen were sort of on display as ceremonial monarchs. Everyone was optimistic. When Wollstonecraft gets there, at the end of 1792, it was a hellscape. And she f just saw violence everywhere, was frightened. She felt she had walked into a Gothic novel um, rather than um, the new paradise. Um, the king was executed. The reign of terror went on for a couple of more years. Really, not until 94 was that over. Um, as a strong man said, look, we got to stop this and export the revolution. Our enemies are not within. Our enemies are the other monarchs of Europe. That was Napoleon. But it took a while for you know that to, to pass. Meanwhile, um, in that same winter, towards the end of that winter, at the French home of Tom Paine, he was um, 
resident in France because he had been convicted of, of treason in England for publishing The Rights of Man. Um, she met a very dynamic, um, morally problematic American frontiersman, author, and adventurer named Gilbert Imlay and began the first passionate love affair of her life with him. And that would be um, that would be an important relationship that would affect her all the way up to her, her death. Oh, it would nearly destroy her because Imlay was a great lover, but not good husband material. And she tried, she attempted suicide twice in despair of um, any happiness with him, even though she had had her first daughter with him. How long did she stay in France? Um, she came back, uh, um, back and forth with England. She came back in um, 90, 94, 95. I can check this just quickly. She know this well, stuff she was there. That's okay. But she was there about four or five years. Oh, she was there for a while. Yeah. And she moved around. Uh, Paris was not a safe place. So she, she moved to Neuilly where she had a, a home with Imlay. That was just sort of east of Paris. She also lived in Le Havre. She went back and forth to Paris, um, depending on whether Paris was um, a safe place or not. Um, yeah, she's um, she doesn't go back to London until 1795. 1795. Yeah. She, she would even write a book on the history of of the French oh, yeah. Revolution. And, and that was it's actually, what she was doing in in Le Havre um, while she was pregnant with her first daughter. I mean, this is someone with a really strong work ethic. But she wrote a pretty massive and pretty impressive history of the French Revolution up to the terror. She doesn't deal with the terror. She deals mm -hmm. with the decadence, the extreme decadence of the Ancien Regime that provoked the revolution. Um, and like many others, she had to sort of spin what happened afterwards. Her story, as many others were, was that the French were not worthy of their revolution. They didn't know how to handle it. Uh, they behaved like children rather than rational adults. They behaved like vindictive avengers rather than leaders of a new order. Um, so... On the other hand, you know, uh, John John Adams, um, I mean, John Adams read this, you know, and he said, she's really an American in her soul. Um, and he admired it. He took more notes in his copy of um, his her history of the French Revolution than of any other book in his library. Um, his wife was reading um, a, you know, Vindication of the Rights of Woman. Um, Wollstonecraft may have become a scandal in England after immediately after she died, but she was a hero in America. And in fact, she and Imlay um, fantasized for a while about emigrating to America and becoming Americans um, on the sort of opportunities of the frontier. When does Mary Wollstonecraft write A Vindication of the Rights of Women? She writes it across 1791. So 1790 is a vindication of the rights of men. Um, pretty quickly, she realized that the famous motto of the French Revolution, liberty, fraternity, and equality, was literally a fraternity. That, as you said in your wonderful introduction, um, the new French order uh, was very ancien regime when it came to women. Um, and women were denied citizenship, participatory citizenship, as well as anything like a substantive education. It was still considered following the model of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who is one of the heroes of the French Revolution for his political principles, but in his education novel, Émile ou l'Education, chapter five called Sophie, is about the education of a perfect wife. And it's all about brainless submission to male authority. That's and, interesting because uh, just, to, to, just to put out Jean-Jacques Rousseau sort of been in fashion again as we have growing criticisms of a neoliberal world as, as somebody who is critical in his own time of the Enlightenment. Oh, yeah. I mean, that he really felt that social institutions were the source of evil. The famous statement, you know, man is everywhere born free and lives in chains. I mean, this is the problem, and it's not an infrequent one on the political left, where progressive men have shining political principles of progress, yet when it comes to women, they can be 
abusive, retrograde, sexist, and dismissive in Wollstonecraft today, in our day. Um, this is not an unfamiliar formation. And it's a very difficult one for progressive women to accommodate themselves to. Um, Rousseau and John Milton in the 17th century were political liberals, anti-monarchists. Um, and yet when it came to women, their um, philosophy, their ideology was very retrograde. And so what's a woman to do? Um, Wollstonecraft's vindication of the rights of woman is long, among other things, because she takes big swaths of text from Milton and from Rousseau and puts it in her book as a kind of anthology against which she reads. She shows us what's wrong with these texts. In the central part of her vindication, I don't know if you've gotten that far in, in your audio book, but it's something of a trial if you're not um, someone in the 1790s who's never thought about reading these books critically as opposed to just as sources of cultural wisdom and instruction. And that's what she did. That's what she did. And she was really the first one to do that. I mean, today we would call it cultural critique or feminist criticism um, or oppositional critique, but she was working it out for the first time. Um, it was a really good thing for her that Milton wrote Paradise Lost, um, as problematic as it is on the subject of Eve's subordination, because no one in her culture could argue with the Bible without being deemed a heretic. So Milton's version of the Bible was an enormous convenience for her. I mean, I, you know, I kind of joked to my students that, you know, if he hadn't written Paradise Lost, she would have, just to have it to argue with. <laughs> um, but so that's, you know, but reading against Paradise Lost, reading against Rousseau's Emile, reading against two very popular conduct books. These were sort of the um, Dr. Spocks of the day, except not progressive like Dr. Spock. In other words, how to raise proper Christian daughters. One was um, Dr. John uh, Gregory's um, legacy to his daughters, which he didn't intend to be published. He was dying. Their mother had died. He wanted to tell them how to get a husband. The other one was published posthumously by his son. The other one was... Um, was uh, uh, Reverend Fortas's sermons to young women. And if you've read Jane Austen's pa uh, Pride and Prejudice, you'll see by the time Austen is doing this, this is set up for, for satire, but it was on every household shelf. And it was the same thing as Milton, teach your daughters to be um, passive, obedient, never to show intelligence, never to show an appetite for physical exercise, um, devote their whole adolescence to training themselves to catch a husband and then become an obedient wife. And um, that's how daughters were brought up. So looking at, again, a, a, a vindication of the rights of women, women, it's important to look at it with as Mary Wollstonecraft looking at the French Revolution at the rights of man at all these great declarations for human rights and yet not having them applied to women yeah I think thanks for bringing that up because she chose her title very carefully it um, among other things or primarily a vindication of the rights of woman is an education track how to educate women better, but she doesn't call it thoughts on female education or letters on female education, the sort of 18th century genres. She makes it a vindication of the rights of woman, categorical, single, um, because she understood woman not to be just the situation of English women or French women, but international and transhistorical. And she wanted it to mirror the document in France, um, you know, the rights of man and the citizen. So she wrote a vindication of the rights of man as her defense of the French Revolution, and then mirror titled a vindication of the rights of woman. Now, vindication is a very specific word choice on her part. Um, it's not just reflections on or thoughts on, um, but it is an activist genre. It means literally a principled defense or an assertion or a justification. 
Milton wrote in Paradise Lost that his purpose was to justify the ways of God to man. Alexander, when he was writing his, Alexander Pope, when he was writing his essay on man, upped the word to vindication, vindicate the ways of God to man. So that's the word that Wollstonecraft wanted, that she was going to write a vindication from another point of view about women and their rights. So she was showing all these men who would be remembered as luminaries in in history. uh, She would be showing all these men with these lofty ideals for their time as being hypocritical. Well, or just incompletely thoughtful. Um, It's as if this was just automatic for them, that of course men are the leaders of the world. And um, some of them put down activist women, but a lot of them were just focused on political progress. Wollstonecraft very deliberately uses the language of slavery and emancipation because the men for whom she's writing were also very active in the abolition movement. That was the other really big political issue then as now. And she basically put it to them that if you are for the abolition of humanity who are being abused on the basis of racial difference, how can you support the abuse of women on the basis of another physical difference, which is sex? Uh, so that, in the, the phrase that you read, you know, one half of humanity um, is, is denied rights on the arbitrary dis, you know, discrimination of, of physical beings. So she was very much pitching her um, vindication to progressive men and to middle class women um, to get women to think differently about their situation, in particular to realize the insult in the language of praise that is often lobbed at women. Did she write? A, did she write about racial slavery? She did. Yeah, I mean, she she has statements to make about racial slavery in um, in vindication of the rights of men. That's one thing she throws at Burke. Um, if you are for the abolition of slavery, how can you be against the French Revolution, which has basically enslaved the working class of France? Um, She compares women to chattel slaves, British women to chattel slaves, in their civil and domestic situations. Uh, And uh, and she also talks about about slavery in general, that if you are revolted by um, the the enslavement of African bodies um, and the culture of sweet sugar that comes from their fatal labor, um, you have to extend this thinking to women as well. So she used slavery as, you know, as an axis, but like a lot of other um, progressives in London, I mean, she was very much, um, uh, you know, in favor of abolition. It wasn't her primary cause. Um, the rights of woman was her primary cause. This is letters. But everything on. she says, you know, about women is, is translatable and it's a mirror of slavery. This is Letters in Politics, and we are in conversation with Susan J. Wolfson, professor of English at Princeton University, and she joins us for a conversation about her book on Mary Wollstonecraft's A Vindication of the Rights of Woman. The term, the tyranny of men, seems significant. Was it significant at the time? Yeah, that's that any system of um, mandatory obedience to arbitrary authority in other words, authority not earned by rational um, policies and rational leadership is tyranny. And tyranny is domestic, the arbitrary power of a father in a household to abuse his children, to beat his wife, to rape his wife, uh, to deny his children food and sub- substance if he, does, if he disapproves of their behavior to throw children out of the home, that's domestic tyranny. Civil tyranny is um, reinforced by the church and the state, keeps women in a state of subordination. They have no civil, no legal rights. When a woman marries, she is transferred from being the property of her father to the property of her husband under a system called coverture which was defined by Blackstone's, you know, laws of England as having no rights. She, her identity becomes nil. Everything that she owns becomes her husband's, 
her children are automatically her husband's property. That's the reason that a lot of women stayed in abusive relationships, because if they left, they would never see their children again. Um, it was a long time coming. I mean, it wasn't until much later um, in the century that um, women even had rights uh, to their children, rights to their earnings as married women, rights to the property that they brought into marriage. Um, you know, these were very slow in incremental developments across the 19th century. In Wollstonecraft's day, women had no rights. So tyranny extends from the legal system to the ecclesiastical reinforcement of this, to the monarchy, um, and to the new capitalists, all of whom had license to tyrannize. So Wollstonecraft has a kind of social palimpsest um, in which all of these situations are readable in terms of each other and also reinforce each other. And even the tyranny of religion with a male god who authorizes the subordination of women. Mary Wollstonecraft is oftentimes seen as the first feminist of, of the Western world. Yeah. Do you think that's an, is, is that an accurate statement? And, and what place? Yes she and no. I mean, I understand the logic. Um, and uh, um, but it's important to realize that um, in her day there was no such thing as feminism. Um, that that word as a descriptor for a philosophy and a group consciousness um, did not occur really until much later in the 19th century. Um, if you look in the OED, it's like you know 1860 or something. And then it takes another 35 years for feminist um, to become a noun, the nominative for someone who is identified with the politics of that group consciousness. Wollstonecraft was working this out on her own before feminism. And so even though retroactively she sort of recruited as the godmother of, um, of European feminism, there was nothing like that to support her. There were just a few women who were thinking these thoughts with her. And one of them was Catherine McCauley. She was dead by the time that Wollstonecraft published Vindication of the Rights of Woman. Um, so she was really quite a pioneer in just putting out this case, that woman as a social and political category is not inevitable, inevitable but reformable. She never uses the word feminist herself. In fact, the the standard way feminist was used was anti-feminist satire, which is a genre that goes all the way back to the, you know Latin uh, Latin poetry in the Middle Ages, where you um, you know viciously make fun of women who do not conform to um, the desired cultural template. That that that's what feminists used to. Work. To, to mean the, the word? Yeah, in other words, the word feminist itself was was only used in the conjunction anti-feminist. And anti-feminist meant a whole genre of anti-woman satire. Feminist as a positive term did not emerge until the middle of the 19th century, um, decades after Wollstonecraft had died. By the new woman decades of the 1890s, it was a word and it was an identification and it was associated obviously with the suffragist movement, um, which, you know, which overlapped with, with, with um, feminist consciousness. Is this an example of taking once a, a negative term and sort of flipping it around and, and, and using it by... Well, the um, yeah, I mean, that would be later work, but I think that that's right. I mean, Wollstonecraft's flipping around a negative term is, um, is her detachment of gender descriptors from biological destiny. So she makes a very strong case, for instance, for masculine, a masculine woman, as, um, as not a stigma. Now, I grew up in an era in which you could still compliment a woman by saying she has a masculine intelligence or a masculine wit, and that was meant as a compliment, but that's the term of upgrade. And we still have that in formations, like when you want, when you want guys to get it together, you tell them to man up. 
right? I mean, that's, um, you know, that's the yeah. upgrade. Yeah. When you want to humiliate guys who don't have it together, you call them girls. I mean, we still live in that kind of linguistic culture where um, masculine is the um, is the, the hierarchical term of praise. Wilsoncraft has a hilarious sentence, I mean, a hilarious um, sort of paragraph in which he takes on um, the stigma of women who are not properly feminine as being called masculine women, which women. I mean, that was that was still part of the satire. Um, so she says, from every quarter have I heard exclamations against masculine women, but where are they to be found, she asks. And then she supplies this answer. If by this appellation men mean to inveigh against their ardor in hunting, shooting, and gaming, I shall most cordially join the cry. But if it be against the attainment of those talents and virtues, the exercise of which ennobles the human character and which raise female in the scale of animal being when they are comprehensively termed mankind, all those who view them with a philosophical eye must, I should think, wish with me that they may every day grow more and more masculine. Women can be masculine without stigma if they are judged by reason, by the quality of mind and character. Correspondingly, men don't have any claim to being manly or masculine if they behave like jerks. Um, if they don't exercise reason, if they waste themselves in bad habits, if they have power only by virtue of being a man and not by virtue of being a reasonable being. So that, for instance, she'll say provocatively, a standing army is filled with effeminate men because they spend all their time playing cards, polishing their dress, flirting, um, developing finer, you know, finer polishes of manners, but no capacity for reason. The clergy are also structurally feminine that way, because all they do is learn by rote and obey their superiors. Um, I mean, these are sort of provocative statements. It's to say gender is a function of social structure, not biology. And in that social structure, both men and women may be masculine or feminine for better or for worse. But these are not biological destinies or limitations. Tell so me. the subtitle of my book is, is called The First of a New Genus. That was Wollstonecraft's self-description. And part of that is rethinking gender and genus. So you think that, that there's, there's a lot of value to a vindication of the rights of women today and are... To, are, are, are to say are, that it isn't. I mean, uh, I'll tell you when when Columbia asked me to write this book, Columbia University Press was doing a series of books on core knowledge, um, you know, books that have shaped shaped thinking. And they asked me to do this um, back in 2019. I was finishing a big book on Keats, so I said I'd love to do it, but I want to I want to finish my Keats book first. And I wasn't really able to get started on this until um, the middle, uh, sort of early last year um, in 2022, January. My Keats book was off to the press in December, and I started right away pulling my thoughts together on this. Then the Dobbs decision comes down in June, and the whole project becomes freshly electric. The press calls me up and said, I know we didn't ask for this book until months into 2023, but do you think you could do it a little sooner? And I said, well, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the Dobbs decision completely um, foregrounded the rights of women and what rights women don't have, not least rights to make their own decisions about their medical care, about their health, about their bodies. Um, can their bodies be enslaved to the state during their years of fertility? I mean, that's a genuine political question now. How much control does the state have over female bodies? We're also hearing from some quarters, Nicholas Fuentes here, um, and um, uh, the young man in Merchant Taylors in, in England, that's the you know, a, a prestigious prep school, that actually we need to rethink whether women should have the vote. 
whether women should be allowed to work outside of the home, whether women should have judgment independent from their husbands. I mean, these are 18th century debates, and they are freshly activated in some very conservative quarters by a new generation of young men. So Dobbs last year, this year, um, access to medication and medical care. Um, I mean, this is not exactly the syntax of Wollstonecraft's polemics in the 1790s, but it is the basic grammar. Susan Wolfson, can you talk to me about how Mary Wollstonecraft has been remembered through time, maybe even beginning in her time? How was she perceived at the time? And then a, a bit of the, and it's a big question. We spend a whole hour on this alone, Huge but question. kind of on the uh, historiography of, 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 of Mary Wollstonecraft and throughout time. Well, it's just, you know, it's very odd because, um, you know, for all her, um, uh, you know, progressiveness in the 1790s um, and, you know, the importance of a vindication of the rights of woman, um, her reputation went into eclipse for almost a century. Um, and it wasn't because she was a radical, on the barricades, um, you know, city-burning uh, revolutionary. Um Vindication of the rights of women was about women becoming more rational so they could be better wives and mothers, of getting a better education, of developing physical strength rather than cultivating delicacy, um, of developing moral behavior rather than capacities for shallow flirtation, um, for um, sexual fidelity in marriage uh, for both men and women for school uniforms, instead of having people focused on sartorial vanity, for co-education, for physical exercise. I mean, these are very rational. So it's really surprising to realize that she went dark for a century. It wasn't because of the rights of woman. It was because when she died unexpectedly from complications in the birth of her second child, the future Mary Shelley, author of Frankenstein, um, her husband, William Godwin, did his grief work writing memoirs of the author of The Vindication of the Rights of Woman, which was published in January 1798. And Godwin, who was very principled and very short-sighted, felt that he had to be completely candid about all the circumstances of her life. So he put down her, um, he reported her futile crush on a married artist, two out of wedlock pregnancies, two suicide attempts from her despair over whether Gilbert Imlay would ever love her the way she wanted to be loved. And he wrote down rather intimate details of her agonizing death uh, from poisoning in her second um, child delivery. Um, the reactionary press could not have been more delighted um, they leapt on this red meat. Uh, they called Wollstonecraft a degenerate, a whore, a prostitute. And with Wollstonecraft, down went the rights of woman. So much mm. so that, um, that when John Stuart Mill wrote The Subjection of Women, um, you know, a really important document in 1869, um, had Wollstonecraft readers in his wife and in his daughter, he could not mention Wollstonecraft's name, though he virtually reproduced her arguments uh, and, and even advanced the case for female suffrage. It wasn't until the 1890s with women who were now identified as feminists who were putting out new editions of the Vindication of the Rights of Woman. That also went out of print pretty much, um, that Wollstonecraft was reborn to a new generation a hundred years on. But the tides were really uneven. There were still people interested in detracting from her. And one of the most notorious that's illustration in my book is this David Levine um, cartoon of Wollstonecraft. I mean, there she is looking like a shrew. And this was to accompany a review by V.S. Pritchett of a new biography of 
Wollstonecraft, in which he said she's just a shallow, narcissistic shrew and, and not a philosopher at all. Her reputation has been very overinflated by these feminists. Now, this was 1970, hmm. um, and by which time women were entering academia, getting appointments for the first time as professors and bringing women's studies um, and feminist critique um, into uh, departments of English and other departments. And this was, you know, an attempt to set back that tide. That's 1970, not 1790. Um, So um, that, you know, Wollstonecraft went back and forth. Uh, She was a champion for Virginia Woolf. but just as many men mm. really didn't want to hear about it. And Wollstonecraft is, you know, is a name for a philosophy, not just a figure by this point. But a champion for Virg- Virginia Woolf, that, that's important. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Virginia Woolf really said um, that, I mean, the amazing thing about uh, Wollstonecraft, Virginia Woolf said, was that um, this is 1929, just 15 months after English women um, secured full suffrage, uh, which is to say women of 21, Um, She said that Wollstonecraft advanced theories and convictions which are so true that they seem to contain nothing new. Their originality has become our commonplace. Um, So that happened, you know, that rights of who could disagree? Women should get education, who could disagree? But Wollstonecraft, um, you know, was a visionary with a a vision that didn't take hold um, very firmly. Virginia Woolf herself was excluded from Oxford and has, you know, a very interesting essay about that um, called Shakespeare's Sister, which is a long um, section in um, a room of a room of uh, one's own um, that uh, she still felt, you know, that 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 Wollstonecraft's vision was was incomplete. Um, but she admired the risks that Wollstonecraft took, however, imperfectly. William Godwin is, is such an f- interesting character oh, yeah. in, in this story. I, I mean, you know, you said he was short-sighted for giving the what full, an honest <laughs> account of Mary Wollstonecraft. Obviously hurt her in the long run, but I guess helped people today, especially historians and academics and people who want to know about Mary Wollstonecraft's story and, and, and her life. But also remarkable to think that, that somebody, and, and they got married, I believe, only because um, Mary Wollstonecraft got pregnant. Yeah, they were both opposed to marriage for for the reasons of, you know, the subjection of women inside of marriage um, once married. Um, Yeah, but they put aside their principles and they got married in order to give legitimacy to uh, Wollstonecraft's daughter um, by Imlay and their coming child. That That was the reason they got married. They still maintained separate residences so they could work um, they had their working days, and they got together in the evenings. And, and he was also known for making sure Mary Shelley, who, as you pointed out, would go on to write Frankenstein, perhaps the most important book in yeah, the last 200 years. Yeah, it's obviously years. a complicated relationship. I mean, that um, here he was with a daughter. First of all, he expected the daughter to be um, a son. So did Mary Wollstonecraft. And they already picked out the name William for uh, the child and then, and then became Mary. So there was that disappointment. And then 10 days later, her mother died. Now, that's not an unusual case for women to die in childbirth. That was one of the ways women died frequently, if not from their first or second or third pregnancies, from their 12th, 13th, 14th, or 15th pregnancies. Um, So here's Godwin with two daughters by a woman he adored who is now dead. It's no coincidence that the iconic novel that Mary Shelley writes is about a creator who is abandoned and it, it despises the creature that he's created. Uh, you know, that's Frankenstein. Um, but that's a kind of psychological trauma that Mary Shelley works out in Gothic terms. Godwin was actually pretty good to his girls. He, um, he educated them. Uh, he took them places. He was a good, good and affectionate father. Um, he, remar- he remarried. He married uh, Mary Jane Claremont, who had a couple of kids from um, other her own affairs, and then they had their own son together. But Mary Jane Claremont was not a good stepmother. She you know, didn't like these girls very much. She preferred her own children. And that's frequently a case with stepchildren, too. 
Ma- Mary um, Shelley was was reading Mary her mom's yeah she was unfinished too. work I think the the wrongs of women woman she was reading Maria. all her mother's stuff I mean that was her primary relationship with her mother as well as the um, portrait that hung above the fireplace in the Godwin home this is the last portrait of um, Mary uh, Mary Wollstonecraft in June 1797. Um, she dies in in September, and she's pregnant with Mary. Oh. It's, it's so a much nicer, probably, much nicer portrait than the one you showed before. Yeah, well, you can see that. I mean, I have a section of my book on called "Representing or Picturing uh, Wollstonecraft," but there's a whole story just in the variety of portraits that um, are out there. Um, I mean, this one now is um, uh, pretty famous. This was done right after she. Are you getting it? Yeah. I don't know. Just so yeah, our listeners that, know, uh, they can look at our YouTube page if they want to see these. Yeah, right. Okay. Well, this, I mean, they're out there also in Google, but that was the one of the working woman that was done by commission um, right after uh, she published her vindications. So that's the working woman portrait. She also has a somewhat hilarious portrait of um, that was commissioned for her after she did the vindication of the rights of men. And here she is, um, she got her hair powdered, she has lace, she's dressed up as a sort of 18th century man of letters, and I think in some, with, with some drag campiness about it, you know, about costuming for the role. And she tells the person who commissioned the role, she said, well, that's one portrait, I don't think it's much of a likeness, but you'll see a better likeness of me in a book that I'm just finishing now, A Vindication of the Rights of Woman. Um, so there, you know, and then there's obviously the Levine caricature, but representing Wollstonecraft is, is also part of her reception and her, um, the various turns of her reputation. Did Mary Shelley ever write about her mom? Indirectly. She wrote about her father. Um, the interesting thing about Mary, Mary Shelley's circumstances, her mother was a scandal, you know, by the time she was born, right? She's born in 1797. Her mother's reputation is toast by January 17th. Couldn't write directly about her, but when she was always known as Mary Godwin when she was growing up, um, she was William Godwin's child. Um, when she gets married to Percy Bysshe Shelley, she becomes Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley, not Mary Godwin Shelley. And she signs herself Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley. The first edition of Frankenstein was anonymous, but when William Godwin um, uh, organized, arranged for a republication in 1823, five years later, on the title page, she's Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley. And so she kept the name as an identification, um, even though she did not know her mother except through her writings and knew her mother only when her mother was a scandal. Susan. But there are portraits, you know, of, of Wollstonecraft everywhere. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, that's okay. Regrettably, we have what I like to call also the tyranny of the clock, which we are <laughs> now at. But Susan Wolfson has been our guest. Again, Susan Wolfson, professor of English at Princeton University, and she has joined us for a conversation on her book called on Mary Wollenscraft's A Vindication of the Rights of Woman. Susan Wolfson, I found that fascinating, and, and I thank you very much for taking this time to join me today. Well, thank you for, for having me. I mean, this is an important book, and I hope people um, will want to read about it in my much shorter book, um, which is uh, you know almost like a novel. And then if they um, are sufficiently intrigued, they, they will go to Mary Wollstonecraft herself. Thank you again.